In like manner, Father, we give thee thanks for the fruit of the vine given to us as a representation of the precious blood of Christ which shed on the cross to secure our redemption and the remission of our sins. Uh, we thank thee for your love for us in sending him and his love for us and offering uh, his body and shedding his blood on the cross. And we take of this in remembrance of him in Jesus' name. All right, it is good to see everybody this evening. We've got um, kind of a, I don't anticipate perhaps finishing this particular question this week, which probably means we may not finish it next week. Uh, just by way of reminder, uh, we'll have our youth devotional here on Sunday night, this coming Sunday night, the 29th. Uh, the group from Hamilton will be here, Ryan, and, and those uh, young people will be here. They will worship with us in this in this assembly and uh, Ryan has agreed to get questions from his kids to answer on Sunday night so we'll do a Q&A next Sunday night but it'll be the questions that he gathers uh, uh, for for the 29th and so if we don't get done tonight depending on how many questions are asked by by his kids uh, you know we, we'll just we'll just have to play it by ear uh, but uh, after uh, after the services uh, next week uh, all the young people will go to the parsonage, and they'll have a period of singing and devotion uh, over there. And uh, while that's going on, if anybody wants to just, you know, anybody wants to stay, can stay. Uh, I left, uh, I left my, my grill and everything from the, the last Saturday bash here, so we're going to just grill hamburgers and hot dogs for the kids while they're having their devotion. Then we'll have the, you know, then they can eat and, and do whatever they need to do, want to do. And so, uh, so that'll be next uh, uh, next Sunday night. And if you if you're thinking ahead, you realize that next Sunday is a fifth Sunday. Uh, that's correct. But what we're going to do is we're going to push our fifth Sunday uh, tradition, so to speak, to the first week of September on uh, Labor Day weekend. So on the first Sunday of September, we'll have our extended uh, our extended morning service and fellowship meal. On September 5th and then no no evening service on the on the 5th and so kind of catch everybody up on on what's going on over the next couple of weeks uh, but this question that we have uh, uh, is says what is the difference between Holy Spirit baptism water baptism and the baptism of fire now as we start our examination of this Something that needs to be understood is there are about eight baptisms that are mentioned in the Bible, particularly in the New Testament. There are the three that we've just mentioned, Holy Spirit baptism, water baptism, baptism of fire. There's also the baptism of Moses from 1 Corinthians chapter 10. They were all baptized unto Moses in the cloud and the sea. There's the baptism of suffering that Jesus mentioned when James and John uh, mentioned, he said, we want to be at your right hand and your left. And he said, are you able to be baptized with the baptism that I'm about to receive? And he was talking about the, a baptism of suffering, dealing, obviously he's talking about his betrayal and the events leading up to his crucifixion and what and whatnot. And so there are a number of baptisms that are mentioned. Then there's John's baptism. Obviously, I should have mentioned that one right out of the box. And then there's in Hebrews chapter 6, there is the mention of the doctrine of washings or the doctrines of baptisms. Also utilizes that same that same word. And so uh, the, the word baptism uh, is not a unique word. In other words, it, it was a common word in the days of the first century. Uh, had it had a uh, a, a variety of nuanced meanings. In other words, the primary meaning is to immerse. And then because it could be nuanced, it could be immersed in water, it could be immersed in suffering. Uh, there, there are a number of applications to, to the general idea of the word. But uh, with regard to, with regard to uh, uh, modern religious practice, uh, the Holy Spirit baptism, water baptism, and then thirdly, I think a distant third, the baptism of fire uh, is, a, uh, is something that needs to be understood. So I want to begin first with, I want to begin first with Holy Spirit baptism. I wish, I wish I had thought ahead of time to tell you to bring your notebooks because this is definitely a notebook style uh, question, something that you'd want to, 
uh, and by the way, I'll give anybody a copy of this outline that I'm working from if, if you want it and, uh, and to copy it down or, or, or to have it. But uh, there, there, is a dis- there are a number of distinctions between Holy Spirit baptism and water baptism. All right? And so what I want to do first is I want to look at some of the marks of Holy Spirit baptism. Um, and, and, and we could, you know, if I was going to, if I was going to do this, uh, speaking about baptism, if I was going to, if I was going to uh, contrast them, and I, I may just do this just for the sake of uh, of illustration and for those that are watching, the first thing that I would mention with regard to Holy Spirit baptism is that it was a promise. Holy Spirit baptism was given as a promise. Uh, Jesus promised the baptism of the Holy Spirit. Uh, It was foretold in uh, Joel chapter 2, verses 28 to 32, and fulfilled in Acts 2 and Acts 10. But uh, the Holy, there, there is... Uh, there is no command for the Holy Spirit baptism. And I think that's something that needs to be understood. No one was ever commanded to be baptized in the Holy Spirit. It was a promise, something that would be done, but not something that was commanded of men to obey or to practice. Secondly, uh, it was a baptism that... um, for lack of a better term, was received representatively. Representatively, okay? Uh, It was representatively uh, received by all men. Meaning Jews and Gentiles. In Joel chapter, again, going back to Joel 2.28, uh, you, know, you know, it shall come to pass in the last days, saith God, that I will pour out of my spirit upon all flesh. All flesh. Now, that phrase has to be properly understood. If it were to be taken, and let's just say, let's just say, first of all, that the word flesh represents men. Because the Bible speaks, for example, in 1 Corinthians 15, all flesh is not the same flesh. There is the flesh of beasts, there is the flesh of birds, there is the flesh of fish, and there is the flesh of man. All right? So we're immediately going to discount the idea that all flesh includes men, beasts, birds, and fish. All right? So now let's focusing then on all flesh, meaning all men. Well, it obviously doesn't mean every single individual person because that would mean every single person, both saint and sinner, right? I mean, if if all flesh was to be understood in an absolute sense, all 7.8 billion people now living would have to receive the baptism of the Holy Spirit. So then obviously we understand that's not the case. It's not every single man. So then we understand, We go to what? how would the Jews understand it and how did Peter explain it? And we understand that the phrase all flesh simply means all men, meaning all types of men. And in the Jewish mind, there were two types of men. Jews and everybody else whether they be Gentiles or Samaritans or, 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 or whatever uh, they might be, the Jews considered there were two types of human flesh, Jewish and everything else. And so the promise to pour out the Spirit on all flesh meant that both Jews and non-Jews would be at some point the recipients of the baptism of the Holy Spirit. Now, Again, no, I said representatively. In other words, there would be a representative of the Jews receiving the baptism of the Holy Spirit, and there would be representatives of the Gentiles who would receive the baptism 
of the Holy Spirit. Obviously, again, not every Jew, not every Gentile. And so this representative, uh, this representative view is fulfilled in two events which are recorded in Acts 2 and Acts 10. Now, most of us are familiar with those two chapters, but for anyone who may not be or those who may be watching and, and are not familiar, in Acts chapter 2, you have the day of Pentecost. Two, chapter 2, verse 1. When the day of Pentecost was fully come, they were all with one accord in one place. They were all with one accord in one place. Who is the they? It's the apostles. It's not the 120 mentioned in Acts 1 and ver earlier in the, in the chapter. Because the, the rules of language say what? That pronouns have to agree with the nearest antecedent noun, right, in person, number, right? The last word of chapter 1 in Acts 1 is apostles. He was numbered, speaking of Matthias, he was numbered with the 11 apostles. Now, when the day of Pentecost was fully come, they were all with one accord in one place. So there's the they. So what is the nearest antecedent noun that satisfies they? Apostles. So we understand that in Acts 2, beginning in verse 1, this event that occurs, occurs only on the 12 apostles. They're called 11 in verse 26 of chapter 1, but there's 12 because Matthias is added to them. So they were all with one accord in one place. That's the apostles. And suddenly there came a sound from heaven as of a rushing mighty wind, and it filled all the house where they were sitting. And uh, there appeared unto them cloven or divided tongues like as a fire, not fire, like as a fire. And it sat upon each one of them, and they were all filled with the Holy Spirit and began to speak with other tongues as the Holy Spirit gave them utterance. So this event happened to 12 men in Acts chapter 2, verses 1 through 4. So the representatives of the Jews in this case are the apostles. And there is no event anywhere in Scripture that indicates that any other Jew received a baptism of the Holy Spirit like that the apostles received in Acts 2, verses 1 through 4. The second representative uh, of the Holy Spirit would be the household of Cornelius. We all understand, those of us that have, have been in the church for a long time, we all understand that Cornelius was the first Gentile to have the gospel preached to him. And, and by the way, it wasn't just him. It was him and his house and, and everybody that he had gathered. He said, we are all here to hear, whatever, to hear all things whatsoever have been commanded of you by God. And so Cornelius, his household, and all of his company there. But Cornelius, is the, he's kind of the, he's the centerpiece of this. All right? And Peter goes and preaches the gospel to the Gentiles for the very first time in Acts chapter 10. By the way, we know this had never happened before because after Peter did it, they called him on the carpet. They called him into question. You went in with uncircumcised men and ate with them. So what did Peter do? He recounted the entire events of Acts chapter 10 about how God talked to Cornelius and how God talked to him and how God brought those two groups together and he said, and when God gave them the Spirit like he gave it to us at the beginning. In other words, Peter described the events of Acts 10. By the way, while Peter was preaching, and I should have said this ahead of time, when Peter was preaching the gospel to Cornelius and those who were gathered with him, it says, And while he was yet speaking, the Holy Spirit fell on all those who heard. And they did the exact same thing that the apostles did in Acts 2. Those Gentiles began to speak in other 
tongues. And by the way, it seems obvious to me that they were likely, and I can't prove this, all right? I can't prove this. But it seems likely to me that those Gentiles were speaking Hebrew. Because Peter and those that had come with him from Joppa understood what they were saying. Now they wouldn't, I mean, they wouldn't, have, a Greek or, or Aramaic or Latin, those wouldn't have been, those wouldn't have been unfamiliar tongues to, to the Cornelius. And it wouldn't have surprised Peter and those men for them to speak any of those languages. But when you've got a, when you've got a, when you've got a man that's a Gentile and he starts speaking Hebrew, it's going to get your attention. Like I said, I can't prove that. But it just seems obvious to me because it was understood that Peter and the rest understood what those men were saying. And they said the same thing that Peter and them said. They proclaimed the wonderful works of God. And so then Peter made the statement, Can any man forbid water, seeing that these have received the Spirit just like we have? Okay? And so the representatives of the Gentiles in Acts 10 is Cornelius and his household. Now, there is no other record of any like event anywhere in the scriptures. These are two, I don't know, it's probably not correct to say two unique events because if something's unique it only means one, it's a one of a kind <laughs> but let's just say it this way this was a one of a kind event that happened twice <laughs> I know that sounds contradictory and it is contradictory but you know what I'm talking about it happened here and it happened here and it never ever happened again because all flesh having the spirit poured out on them was fulfilled in Acts 10 by the way, if we were, if we were to go back, if we were to go back uh, to, uh, to Isaiah uh, and look at uh, Isaiah 62 and, and talk about how the Gentiles would see the righteousness of God, then this, uh, this is, Acts 10 is that event. Acts 10 is the fulfillment of the Gentiles receiving or, 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 or seeing, witnessing uh, the righteousness of, of God. And so, so the baptism of the Holy Spirit was not commanded. It was a promise. It was not literally for every man, but was representative of all kinds of men, Jew and Gentile. Number, uh, number uh, three... It was administered by God. And I think that's important to remember. God is the one. What did John say of Jesus? He shall baptize you in the Holy Spirit and with fire. Matthew chapter 3. Uh, the baptism of the, of the Holy Spirit was administered by God, not by man. That also kind of goes to how can you command somebody to be baptized in the Holy Spirit when God is the only administrator? John, you going to command God to do something? <laughs> yeah, I'm not going to I'm not going to command God to do anything. God is the administrator of the of the, of the Holy Spirit baptism. All right? And so as as being administered by God, it cannot be commanded of or by man. Number four, it was, let me put this, I, the only way I know how to say it, and I know I'm getting down here at the bottom of the, bottom of the uh, board. There is no name or authority attached to the Holy Spirit baptism. And what I mean by that is, when we talk, when we talk, when we're going to talk in just a moment about water baptism, we see that water baptism was administered in the name of. In other words, there was an authority. Now, being administered by God, there was no appeal to authority because God is the administrator. So God, God needs not administer it in any by anybody's authority, because He Himself is the authority. But water baptism is commanded. 
in the name of. In other words, there is an, there is an appeal to authority. And so it was given with no name or authority. By the way, John's baptism had an authority, right? It was the baptism of John. Jesus' baptism had an authority. It's the baptism of Jesus. But Holy Spirit baptism was not administered in the name of the Holy Spirit. It was a baptism of and by the Holy Spirit. Then uh, number, let's see, number next. It is not, Holy Spirit baptism is not the one baptism of Ephesians chapter 4 and verse 5. There is one Lord, now Paul, Paul making this statement to the Ephesians. There is one Lord, one faith, and what? One baptism. There's only one baptism. By the time Paul wrote to the Ephesians in Ephesians 4 and verse 5, there was only one baptism. Huh? You got two? How many? No, no, I got two. I got two points. All right, let me hear it. That's right. Did everybody hear that? When there's only one baptism... I, I don't have the liberty to say, well, this, this one baptism is the Holy Spirit baptism or the water baptism. It is only one. It's only one. It's not one or the other. It's only one. That's right. It's not one or the other. It's only, it's only one. It can't be water and then... But over here, it's Holy Spirit. As needed. As needed. Yeah, as needed. By the way, this is and, I, and what John's getting at is an important point because those who, today who believe in Holy Spirit baptism practice water baptism. Isn't that right? Those who believe in Holy Spirit baptism practice water baptism. As if Ephesians 4 and verse 5 says there's one Lord, one faith, but two baptisms. Now, now that seems like an oversimplification, but I don't know how to get around that. You know, why would anybody practice? Why would anybody practice water baptism if Holy Spirit baptism is the one of Ephesians four and verse five? You see, you see how contradictory that is. Well, there's only one baptism, but we practice, we believe in two. We believe in water baptism, by the way, which precedes Holy Spirit baptism. That's what that's what the, that's what they that's what they believe. And so, Holy Spirit baptism is not the one baptism of Ephesians four and verse five. Now, let me also note this, and this goes back this goes back to this uh, to this representative uh, view. Both of these events were marked by the same thing. I mentioned this, but I want to emphasize it. Both of these events were marked by the same thing. Open your Bibles, if you would, please, to Acts. We're going to look at Acts 10 and 11 real quick, okay? Because I, I want to make this crystal clear. Acts 10, verse 44. Acts 10, verse 44. All right. While Peter was still speaking these words, he's preached, he, by the way, he's just finished preaching Jesus Christ, Him crucified, and raised from the dead. All right. Verse 44. While Peter was still speaking these words, the Holy Spirit fell upon all those who heard the word. Now note, first of all, that did not include Peter. And it did not include the people that Peter brought with him. It's talking specifically about those Gentiles. All right? And those of the circumcision who believed were astonished as many as came with Peter because the gift of the Holy Spirit 
had been poured out on the Gentiles also. For they heard them speak with tongues and magnify God. Then Peter answered, Can anyone forbid water that these should not be baptized who have received the Holy Spirit just as we have? Now, Peter describes the event going on right there as being identical to the event of Acts 2. Now, look over in Acts 11. In case, there, in case there's any question, look at Acts 11, verse 15. Peter's been, as we mentioned, he's been called in on the carpet. What does he say? He says, And as I began to speak, the Holy Spirit fell upon them... As upon what? Us at the beginning. Who's the us? Apostles. It's the apostles. But then look at verse 16. Sometimes we miss verse 16. Then I remembered the word of the Lord. How he said, John indeed baptized with water, but you shall be baptized with the Holy Spirit. If therefore God gave them the same gift as He gave to us when we believed on the Lord Jesus Christ, who was I that I could withstand God? Peter describes the event of Acts 10 as the baptism of the Holy Spirit. Right? He describes it as the baptism of the Holy Spirit. I remember Jesus said this was going to happen. Alright, one more. Acts 15 verse 8. Let's start in verse 7. This is in the Jerusalem Council, the big argument about circumcision. It says, When there had been much dispute, Peter rose up and said to them, Men and brethren, you know that a good while ago God chose among us that by my mouth the Gentiles should hear the word of the gospel and believe. So God, who knows the heart, acknowledged them. No, acknowledged them by giving them the Holy Spirit just as He did to us. That sounds exactly like what He said in Acts 11, doesn't it? In other words, what happened to them in Acts 10 was exactly what happened to us in Acts 2. Just like He explained in Acts 11, He explained in Acts 15. But there's one more verse. Let's keep reading. And this is really important. In verse, uh, in verse 8, it says, He gave them the Holy Spirit just as He did to us and made no distinction between us and them, purifying their hearts by faith. Now, when did the Gentiles have their hearts purified by faith? Let's go back to Acts 10. In verse 47, he said, Can any man forbid water that these should not be baptized who have received the Holy Spirit just as we have? And he commanded them to be baptized in the name of the Lord. That's when their hearts were purified by faith. Peter said two things happened. He gave them the Spirit just like He did to us and He purified their hearts by faith. Not at the point of faith alone, but through an act of faith. They still had to be baptized in order to have their hearts purified. And the remission of sins. Yeah, well, yeah, when I say hearts purified, I mean by extension, the remission. Right. So... When a person is baptized in the name of the Lord Jesus, that's when their heart is purified. I mean, what did Peter teach in Acts 2? Repent and be baptized, every one of you, in the name of Jesus Christ for the remission of your sins. Now, what did Jesus say in the Great Commission? 
Repentance and remission of sins be preached in my name among all nations beginning at Jerusalem. Luke 24, 47. He who believes the gospel and is baptized shall be saved. Mark 16, 16. What did Paul himself say about his own baptism? I was told to arise and be baptized and wash away my sins. So the, the biblical text, the New Testament text is clear. A man's heart is purified by faith when he's baptized for the remission of sins. Note, there is a distinction in Acts 10 between the event of the baptism of the Holy Spirit and the event of the baptism of water. But only one of those two brought the remission of sins. Right? And which one was it? Well, baptism of water. Here's something I wish. If, if I, And I, look, I think about this a lot. And it, it all goes back to the conversation I had with a denominational preacher friend of mine back some months ago. If you can define for me what it means to be baptized in the name of Jesus Christ, it'll go a long way in solving a lot of our religious differences. Now, I'll just give, I'll just give you an example. And, and not because I'm not picking on anybody, but I mean, it, it, you can find it. You know, in, in the Methodist book, it says, We accept anybody who's been baptized in the name of the Father, Son, and Holy Spirit, whether they've been sprinkled or poured or immersed. Well, so then what does it mean to be baptized in the name of the Father, Son, and Holy Spirit? What does it, what, I mean, what does it mean to them? Can, can you define what it means to what is associated with baptism in the name of the Father, Son, and Holy Spirit? Let me, see, let me explain to you where I'm going with this. You can't be sprinkled in the name of the Father, Son, and Holy Spirit because the Bible doesn't authorize that. You can't have water poured on you in the name of the Father, Son, and Holy Spirit because the Bible doesn't authorize that. The only thing that the Bible authorizes for baptism is immersion. Then narrowing it down, the Bible, you can't be baptized in the name of the Father and the Son and Holy Spirit if you believe you're already saved. Because the Bible doesn't authorize that. The Bible only authorizes immersion in water to receive the remission of sins. That's the baptism of the Father. In the, in the Father, Son, and Holy Spirit. It's the baptism in the name of Jesus. You know, what I said some weeks ago is, you know, saying I baptize you in the name of the Father, Son, and Holy Spirit is not some magic phrase that validates a thing that's being done. To do, thing, to do a thing in the name of the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit means it has to be done in accordance with the teaching of the Father and the Son and the Holy Spirit. And so if you could just get, if you, could, if you were having a discussion, look, if you're going to have, this is one of those ways where you can, and I hate to say it this way, but this is one of the things where you can put the burden of proof on another person. Ask them to tell you what it means to be baptized in the name of Jesus. Yeah. By the way, everybody watching online, what does it mean to be baptized in the name of Jesus? And I want it specific. Tell me in specific terms what it means to be baptized in the name of Jesus. Now, when a person can define that according to the scriptures, it's going to solve a lot of problems. Well, actually, for a lot of people, it's going to create a lot of problems because they're going to understand they've not been baptized in the name of Jesus. They've not been baptized in the name of the Father and the Son and the Holy Spirit because just saying that don't make it so. 
And so baptism of the Holy Spirit is not the one baptism of Ephesians 4 and verse 5. The baptism of Jesus, the baptism in the name of Jesus is the baptism. By the way, do we have an example of anybody at Ephesus being baptized in the name of Jesus? Like in Acts chapter 19, you know, Paul went to the city of Ephesus and he found certain disciples and he said, have you received the Holy Spirit since you believed? They said, we have not heard whether there such, be a, such a thing as the Holy Spirit. Paul answered and said, unto what then, in other words, for what purpose or what teaching were you baptized? They said, unto John's baptism. Paul responded. John verily baptized with the baptism of repentance, saying that you should believe on him who is to come after, that is on Christ. And when they heard this, they were baptized in the name of the Lord Jesus. Just like Cornelius in Acts 10. Just like those on the day of Pentecost in Acts 2. So once we, once we can firm up what it means to be baptized in the name of the Lord Jesus, we can solve a lot, we can solve a lot of difficulties. And so, so this baptism, uh, this baptism of the Holy Spirit that the Gentiles received had absolutely no connection to the remission of sins. By the way, the baptism that the apostles received had no connection to the remission of sins. Were the apostles saved or lost when they got the baptism of the Holy Spirit? Well, they were saved. They're the apostles, right? But Cornelius and his household, by definition, were still lost when they received the baptism of the Holy Spirit. Because if they had already been saved, they couldn't have been baptized in the name of the Lord Jesus. Acts 10, 48. And Paul couldn't have spoken, Paul. Peter could not have spoken to them as having their hearts purified by faith, as he mentioned in Acts 15 and verse number 8. And so the baptism of the Holy Spirit is these. All right, now we've got a few minutes, and I'll just, let me just draw the contrast. Let me pull this, pull this over just a little bit. All right. While the baptism of the Holy Spirit was a promise, water baptism is a command. I mean, Acts 10, 48, he commanded them to be baptized in the name of the Lord Jesus. You know, Peter commanded it on the day of Pentecost. What shall we do? Repent and be baptized. That's a command. It's an imperative. Be baptized, every one of you, in the name of Jesus Christ for the remission of your sins. And so, whereas the Holy Spirit baptism was a promise, water baptism is a command. All right? Secondly, whereas Holy Spirit baptism was received representatively by all men, water baptism is for... All men, literally. Every single man, and when I mean man, I mean human being. Every single human being on the planet who is of the age of accountability is obligated to receive water baptism for the remission of sins. That's why they went into all the world preaching the gospel and practicing which baptism? Water baptism. He who believes the gospel and is baptized shall be saved. Go and make disciples of all nations. How do you do that? Baptizing them into the name of the Father and the Son and the Holy Spirit. Matthew 28 and verse 19. Again, repentance and remission of sins preached in my name among all nations beginning at Jerusalem. You see, there was a baptism that was practiced all over the planet. Because it was commanded of every single human being. Again, of accountable age. What are you going to say, John? Before you get to the end of this, the Holy Spirit baptism. Yep. That necessity was of God. He needed from the furtherance of the gospel. The water baptism is a necessity to us. Forgiveness of sins. 
Yeah, the Holy Spirit baptism was given so that the so that the, so that the word of God could go through to go could go through the whole world. But water baptism is part of the gospel which is preached to the whole world. That's a good point. Good point. All right, uh, also this. Uh, because it is a command and it's because it's for all men, it is an act of obedience. It's an act of obedience. Holy Spirit baptism is not an act of obedience. In fact, of the, by the way, think about this. Of the two times that the Holy Spirit uh, baptism was administered, neither group knew it was coming. What? It fell on them. That's right. It, neither one of them knew it was coming. What's that? Yeah, you have to be in the right room. And that, you understand what he's saying? The apostles didn't gather on the day of Pentecost because they were expecting to receive the Holy Spirit. Jesus said, go to Jerusalem and wait. And they'd been there 10 days. You know, they'd been there 10 days. They didn't, they didn't know, they didn't know about, they didn't know how it was going to happen. Jesus just said, you go in Jerusalem and wait, and this is going to happen. But there was no indication of what to expect. Now, what about Cornelius? Did they expect what they got? No. No sign that they were going to get what they got. And so. So, Holy Spirit baptism was received by those who were not expecting it. Baptism of water is an act of, of obedience that man himself must initiate. Based, like, obviously, based on his understanding of the gospel. Just like the eunuch. See, here's water. What hinders me from being baptized? And so, water baptism is an act of obedience. Also, I would add, add this to it. Water baptism is an act of faith. Colossians 2 and verse 11 and 12, but particularly verse, uh, well, particularly those two verses, teach us that we are buried with him by baptism and raised through faith in the work of God. Now, what is that faith? It's a faith that God's going to forgive me of my sins. That's the only faith a man can have when he's baptized is that God said when I'm baptized, he'll remit me of my sins. Therefore, I'm going to submit to baptism based in my faith on the promise that God's going to do for me exactly what he said he would. We're buried with him in baptism and then raised through faith in the working of God who raised him from the dead. All right, then this. Um, baptism of water is administered by name or authority. Most often it's called in the name of the Lord Jesus Christ. Acts 2.38, Acts 10.48, Acts 19 and verse 5. Now let me just take a moment here because I got this question uh, by email this week. The question was, what is the difference in baptism in the name of the Father, Son, and Holy Spirit and the baptism in the name of Jesus? There's a lot of confusion about that. Even among our brethren. By the way, if you read, if, I think I put it up, Johnny, the, the, the Mac Lynn book on the Churches of Christ in the United States, there is a group of, of our brethren who when they baptize, they make sure they only say, in the name of Jesus. And if you look in the designation, they are the J-O designation. And there's not a whole lot of them, but there's enough of them that they exist. And that simply means Jesus only. When they administer baptism, they make sure they only say, I baptize you in the name of Jesus. Now, what they have done is exactly what the denominations have done by saying in the name of the Father, Son, and Holy Spirit. They've turned that into some kind of magic phrase that I've got to say the right thing in order to make the baptism right. And if I say the right thing, it makes it right. But that's, that, that's a false, that is a false premise. That's a false understanding. Jesus said, baptized unto the name in Matthew 28, 19. Unto the name of the Father and of the Son and the Holy Spirit. 
When Jesus made that statement in Matthew 28, 19, he's talking about that when we're baptized, we enter into a relationship with the Father and the Son and the Holy Spirit. It would be somewhat akin to the fact that uh, your wife took your name when she became your wife. In other words, there was a relationship change, and by the way, and it's not necessary to take that name in order for obviously for marriage to be valid, but it illustrates it. That when there was that change of relationship from being the fiance to being the bride, there was a change of name because there was a change of relationship. Baptism changes a relationship. It changes our relationship with the Father. It changes our relationship with the Son. It changes our relationship with the Holy Spirit. But that's why it's spoken of as being unto the name of the Father, Son, and Holy Spirit. And so when we see in Acts 2, when we see in Acts 2 and 10 and 19 that they were baptized in the name of Jesus, all that means is they were baptized with the baptism that Jesus authorized. That's all that means. When they were baptized in the name of the Lord Jesus, they were baptized with the baptism that Jesus commanded. Well, what kind of baptism was that? That was a baptism under the name of the Father and Son and Holy Spirit. It was an immersion in water. It brought the remission of sins. It brought salvation. Uh, it brought uh, the Holy Spirit. In other words... In the name of just simply means the one he commanded. And it's not just one thing attached to it. All of those things are attached to the baptism in the name of Jesus. And so to say in the name of the Father, Son, and Holy Spirit or in the name of Jesus doesn't make any difference. To say one is to say the other. And to say the other is to say the one. Again, whatever I say when somebody wants to be baptized is of absolutely no relevance whatsoever. You know, I don't have to say the right thing in order to make that baptism right. Is that correct? It doesn't have anything to do with me. Yeah, 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 yeah. I'm just, I'm just, I'm just the, I'm just the, the what did you say, the implement. I'm the implement through whom the person is obeying the gospel. That's right. Because you can't baptize yourself. You can't baptize yourself. And so I'm, I'm the implement through which God is administering the baptism in the name of Jesus. By the way, I don't have to say a thing. Why do I, why do I say what I say? For us. For that. Yeah, yeah, the, the, yeah, the confession... Yeah, but when, when I'm when I'm up there in the when I'm up there say when I was up there in the water with Carl, and I say or Aaliyah, and I say I baptize you, and then, and here's what I said: based on your confession that Jesus Christ is the Son of God, I now baptize you under the name of the into the name of the Father, Son, and Holy Spirit for the remission of your sins. That's pretty much my spiel. I just try to say the same thing every time. But why do I say that? And John said. For the audience's sake, as a reminder of what's transpiring and for the benefit of those that are younger. You know, when, when, you know when, 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 whether it be a young person or an old person obeys the gospel, you know, I want, you know, I want Owen, I want Carter, I want, uh, you know, I want Kaylin, Mariah, you know, I, I want all the young people, I want Hayden. I want them to understand exactly what's going, exactly what's going on. Kind of like, kind of like uh, in Exodus twelve and thirteen. You know, when the Passover. You know, we talked about this morning. What do these things mean? So you explain them to your children. You know, if I got up there and just baptized them and didn't say anything, it'd make your job more difficult to explain what's going on. That's right. Jesus spoke directly to his father. And by the, way, the father spoke to him. And he said, this didn't happen for my benefit. It happened for yours. And so what I say is just, is just a matter of a teaching tool. Yeah, Johnny. This, this doesn't have anything to do with baptism. But just to prove a point and to help everybody, I'd like to share this with you. Josie.
That's right. That's right. And so, I wanted my kids to see me be baptized, right? So that it would be important they would see that it was important to me, and in turn, be important to them. Right. It's like I remember when Philip obeyed the gospel uh, back in '99, uh, and and he called me on is going to be on a Sunday night, and I knew Philip was as shy as anybody I'd ever met. And I said, I said, I said, man, do you want to come right now and come, you know, do you want to come before services and let's do this and do this right now? And he said, and here's what he said. He said, no. He said, I want, he said, I want to come forward in front of everybody. He said, I want them to see it. I want them to see it. And uh, I always respected that because, look, I knew he was scared to death. And by the way, Logan did the same thing. Logan was scared to death. I mean, he'd grown up in this building. There, he knew everybody in this building. He was scared to death to walk an aisle, but he did. You know, and it and it and it meant something. And so, you know, I say these things as a means of teaching because it's important. You know, I think the table talks are good because it shows that the Lord's Supper is just not something that's kind of stuck in between the singing and the preaching. It's something that we do. You know, we want to under, we want our kids to understand it's important. You know what we're doing. What we're doing here, and so so what I say is of of no efficacy with regard to the baptism itself. It's just simply a reminder and a teaching tool. By the way, there might be somebody in because you know there could be somebody in the audience that's not a, an adult. You know, hopefully we got visitors, and when they see something like that take place, they understand. Look, this is important. You know, this is not just something that that we put off until it's convenient. You know, this is something that we do. You know, because because God commands it. Um, the, then the last three things with regard, very quickly, the last three things about water baptism. Uh, one is, it's a condition of salvation. Water baptism is a condition of salvation. Jesus made it such, Peter made it such, Paul made it such. All the New Testament makes water baptism a condition of salvation. It's the only way a person can obey the gospel. A person cannot obey the gospel without being baptized, having receiving water baptism. Uh, Jesus said, you know, he who believes the gospel and is baptized. Well, there are a number of places in the New Testament that speak about those who have not obeyed the gospel. What's he talking about? They've not been, certainly he's included. They've not been baptized. Right? But they have not all obeyed the gospel. Romans 10, 16 to 18. What shall be the end of them that obey not the gospel? 1 Peter 4, 15. He shall in flaming fire take vengeance on them who know not God and obey not the gospel. 2 Thessalonians 1. And verses 8 through 10. You know, obviously, baptism is a part of that. And so baptism is a condition of salvation, and it's the only way that a person can obey the gospel. And it is, uh, it can, I'll, I'm not going to write it, but it's slow, you won't even be able to see it. It continues until the end of the world. Matthew 28. Baptizing them in the name of the Father, Son, and Holy Spirit, teaching them to observe all things whatsoever I have commanded you, and lo, I'm with you always, even to the end of the world. Jesus said that water baptism continues until he comes again. It is the one baptism of Ephesians 4 and verse 5. It will not end as, as a condition of salvation as long as this world stands. The baptism of the Holy Spirit ended in Acts 10. Baptism in water continued after Acts 10, continues today, and continues as long, as long as the world stands. It's a condition of salvation. All right, any questions on that? Comments? Smart remarks? All right, let me I'll turn this off. We had a pretty good live audience th this evening. Um,